uh, first day after midterm. Not everybody's grades are posted yet in um, Blackboard because um, I, well, I mean, obviously some of you just turned it in this morning, but I've also got some for people who submitted it in Blackboard. I've got some of those papers still to grade. So um, my Tuesday, Thursday classes tomorrow morning are going to see a very bloodshot person with, um, uh, with rings under my eyes because um, y'all, you know, as much bellyaching as some, some people do, not y'all, but as some people bellyache, you know, about, oh my goodness, four essay questions, I'm going to die. Um, but y'all have four essay questions each. I have 125 students who are turning in four essay questions each. So I've got like, um, I've told my husband, go out to dinner with your friends tonight and leave me alone. <laughs> because I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to um, definitely pull an all-nighter and have your grades posted by, uh, midterm grades posted by tonight um, on the portal. Now, some people who, uh, I, don't, I don't remember whether it's anybody in your class or anybody online in particular, but some people have contacted me to say that they need an extra day or two to turn this in, and that's absolutely fine with me. However, if that is you, if you're one of those people who needs another day, I have to submit midterm grades today anyway, so your grade for this assignment will go in as a zero. Um, but, and so don't freak out if your, um, if your average looks a lot lower on the portal than, of course, you want it to be. You and I will know that your average is much higher than that if you turn it in a day or too late. Okay, I will still grade you for, um, grade you for that assignment, uh, depending upon how late or incomplete it is. Of course, there will be points off for that. But, um, but anyway, you will, you know, you can turn it in late, but you'll just have a, you know, that grade penalty um, for that. So, uh, any questions or anything? about the first half of the semester, because technically this is like, the, it, it happens to be a Wednesday, but it, it is also the Wednesday of the semester. If you're looking at the whole semester as, um, you know, that weekly metaphor, this is hump day. So we are starting on new material today. We're, we finished up with chapter six, and the midterm included information that you needed from chapters one through six. And now we're starting on chapter seven, we're going to focus heavily on chapter seven and eight, um, and uh, we're going to do a little bit of a few topics from chapters nine and ten, and then we're going to have another test. And um, I need some feedback about the, the test slash project uh, model. So obviously, three weeks ago, three and a half weeks ago, I don't remember how long ago it was, we had that multiple choice test that you had to do online. Everybody remember? 100 points, all multiple choice. You just turned in this midterm project thing that is technically one of the tests, one of the four 100-point tests we're having in the class. Um, and so which, so I, we're going to have two more 100-point tests. Do you want them to be one multiple choice, one like this, half multiple choice, half like this for both of them, both multiple choice, or both like this? <laughs> My chances are higher. Yeah, I'm not a Why? Writer. Well, well, well let us see our grades. <laughs> that's fair. Let yeah. us see how you did. Because usually people's grades are higher on this kind of thing. Yeah, honestly. Like, oh, right. Exactly. On multiple choice, there's right or wrong, and on this, there are lots of different approaches you can take, and you can say, here's the evidence that I, here's why I think this is, is true, and you can, you can like state your, you make your argument, that's what it's called. So, um, so yeah, there's like not just one answer to number one, two, three, and four. There are 75 different correct answers to one, two, three, and four, because you can use whatever evidence you want. Definitions are definitions, you know, so when I ask you for a definition of deviant behavior or something, obviously that's a, you know, that is something that is going to only vary a little bit from student to student. But that would also kind of suck for you to have to do that in your class. Um, but I work here. You know, th thank you for thinking, <laughs> thank you for, th for thinking, um, you know, gee, multiple choice is so much easier on the teacher. Well, it is, let me just tell you, it really is, but it doesn't really give me any information about whether y'all are getting this or not, or whether y'all have, like, changed since day one until day, um, 
what day, how many days do we have? I don't know. Until the end of the 15th week, you know, when we're finished, I have to see like changes. And so, um, so what I'm leaning toward doing is half multiple choice and half like this, because this is, um, these essays being able to express yourself and like you were saying, Coco, um, you have a variety of different ways you can answer these questions and, and they are correct. It really is a great boost. These kinds of things um, are great boosts over multiple choice because honestly people um, sometimes have to take multiple choice tests like 17 times in order to improve, you know, to get an A or something. People are usually in the 75 to 85% range. You know, and uh, and that can bring a great down if you're if you're shooting for that A, like I want y'all to get. Okay, yeah. So we'll wait till these um, grades are posted, and I'll get your feedback about that. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so let's get some new material, and it's new material, but you're going to hear a ton of old words, okay, because we're not leaving the first half of the semester behind. You have to um, remember all of the stuff that we discussed um, the first half of the semester, and like, things like social institutions, things like statuses and roles, the American dream, which we ended uh, with last week. Um, we were talking about the American dream heavily uh, in the last two lectures that we've had. That's going to be a primary topic that we're going to look at um, moving forward because it's going to um, focus a lot on, um, well, social stratification, which is the topic of Chapter 7, is going to focus a lot on this concept of American dream when we're talking about the United States. And when we get to other countries and look globally at social stratification, um, we'll still be able to take some of those ideas wrapped up in the American dream and analyze other countries. Okay? All right. So this is from Chapter 7. And the topic for the next couple of weeks as we go from Chapter 7 and Chapter 8, the topic is called social stratification. <clears throat> I teach geography also. I've got a cultural geography class that I emailed y'all about taking um, next semester if you want to. I think I see a couple of familiar names. Yeah. Are you in it? Great. Good. Yeah, I, th I saw a couple of familiar names on the roster when I looked at it. Anyway, stratification means layering. In geography, we used it to talk about like the layers of the earth or the layers of the atmosphere, like magma and bedrock and, you know, aquifers and topsoil and everything, right? So those are the different layers of the earth. Well, in sociology, we borrow this word from geography and geology, and we use it as a metaphor to talk about inequality in society. Okay? So social stratification is the ranking of people in a population based on their access that they have to social resources. ranking of people in society based on their access to social resources. We're going to have to talk about and clarify what this thing means, this last word social resources means. But this ranking word, of course, comes from this parallel, um, excuse me, this uh, Layering and ranking are the, are the words that are linked here is where stratification comes into it. <clears throat> okay, so we're talking about people in an entire population. Therefore, what kind of perspective are we talking about here? At the population level, correct, we're talking about macro. Because a population, how many people are in the United States? I don't know the current number, but the last census in the year 2010 was like 341 million people. Does that sound right? Uh, yeah, so it's probably going to be something like 350 million people or something after this census that's coming up in uh, the year 2020. Don't know. 
but that's a whole heck of a lot of people. We're talking about the United States society as a whole. So stratification, we talk about on the macro scale, the macro scale. You and I have life experiences based on the position we occupy within this macro scale arrangement. Okay? So you and I have micro level life experiences based on the position we occupy within this macro scale arrangement. What's another word for a position in society? A status. Excellent. So we have to bring in all those words that we've built up, all the vocabulary that we've built up since day one. We're bringing it up to this point so that we can now use those words without having to define them each time in our notes. So you can say, if I ask you for a definition of social stratification, you can say it is a comparison or a ranking of different category of people's status to the next person. Categories of people is a definition to the, um, from the first half of the semester. Status is a definition from the first half of the semester. So you can use those words um, in your definitions of social stratification if I ask you for one in writing at any point. Okay? Um, so we are going to use in our uh, lectures this time around, we're going to use... We're going to use a ladder metaphor. See my beautiful ladder? Okay, we're going to use a ladder metaphor, like your textbook author does, to describe these different layers or the ranking hierarchy of the different categories of people. Okay? So each of the rungs of the ladder, the rungs represent categories of people. Okay. The rungs represent categories of people. In the United States, there are seven different categories of people that we discuss that we categorize based on three different achieved statuses. It's a combination of three different achieved statuses. Okay? So each rung represents a different, what we call socioeconomic status. Each rung represents a different socioeconomic status. Have you all heard that word before? Socioeconomics. Socioeconomic status. Maybe, you're, maybe you've heard it before. Okay. Sometimes I've got a class full of people who are like, oh, yeah, we've taken another class. We talked about that the whole time, right? And so sometimes people haven't heard of it before. So let's make sure that we start at the very beginning um, to explain what this is. Okay? So... Um, in our recent lectures, I'm not sure which one it was, but recently, within the last two or three class periods when we had lectures involved, we talked about three achieved statuses that are really important in the United States. Three achieved statuses that are really important in the United States. Education is one. Good. Income is the next. And occupation, thank you. Good, we work together, we get them all. Perfect, okay. Yes, these are achieved statuses as we already have them marked in our notes. Achieved statuses. Socioeconomic level is a combination, or socioeconomic status is a combination of all three of these statuses into one, okay? 
So when we refer, when sociologists, political scientists, government officials, historians, anybody who studies society, when you hear us refer to socioeconomic status or socioeconomics, we are referring to these buzzwords. The definition of socioeconomic status is a combination of these three achieved statuses. We consider all of them mixed into one. Is there a link between these statuses anyway? Is there a logical link between these statuses? Okay, such as what? So you have to get an education so you can get, so you, get a good occupation. So you have to get an education to get a good occupation so that what? So that you can make the income that you want. Do we like that description? I just repeated you because your voice won't come very you know, very uh, loudly on the video for the online students. So that's why I was repeating you. Okay, so yes, so we have to get an education uh, of a certain type so that we can get an occupation that is desirable, respectful, interesting, plug in a different word to describe the occupation that you want. And usually the occupations that people aspire to or try to achieve have a certain income associated with them so that you're not working two and three jobs the whole rest of your life? Can I get an amen? <laughs> amen, <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, I was already had a lot of gray hair showing uh, by the time I quit my second job after my student loans were paid off. Yes, finally. Quit, quit my second job in my 40s, let me confess. I was already in my 40s by the time my, my student loans, I had to pay my student loans off. Anyway, so yes, education is linked to the occupation you are uh, eligible for, qualified for. And based on your qualifications and based on the importance or um, significance of that occupation in the social stratification system, your income is going to be higher. When you combine all of those three achieved statuses into one name, the name is socioeconomic status. That's what all seven of these rungs on this ladder that represents um, social stratification in the U.S. of A. All seven of these rungs are different socioeconomic statuses. Questions? Okay. Now I'm going to draw another arrow from these achieved statuses. Or actually, no, I don't. I, I was worried that I was going to have to draw a line through this, this statement. I'll just go from socioeconomic status here on the board to right above it. Because now we know that socioeconomic status is a combination of all of these things. And we know that social stratification is ranking people in comparison to each other based on social resources. So we need to talk about what social resources are. And it turns out that the predominant social resources that um, we rank people with are these three achieved statuses. Was that clear? That seems like that, that sentence was extremely complicated. Like their and it didn't access exist. to those? Their access to, exactly. Your access to opportunities to achieve these three t things in life are the social resources that we're talking about. Make sense? Okay. So let me do like another arrow. I think that probably my video is not going to show this section of the board, so I'll make sure and get a photograph of it for online students. But let's talk about social resources for a second. You see my arrows linking education, occupation, and income to socioeconomic status, and then an arrow from socioeconomic status to social resources. Now let's get an arrow off to the side to explain what social resources are. Yes, social resources include education, opportunities for education. Yes, social resources include opportunities for jobs. Yes. 
Yes, opportunities include, social resources include opportunities to get money. And of course, this is the US dollar sign. Um, I'm just using it to represent money all over the world. We are gonna talk about how we can, can rank people in countries of the world to each other. So we can do that on the basis of money. They have different signs for different countries in the world, but we'll just use the US dollar symbol for now. But social resources also include things like privileges, which include things like being able to vote, or being able to drive, rights, like being able to own property, or being able to assemble and have freedom of speech, something like that. Those are social resources. Social resources also include things called raw materials. You've probably seen this phrase, raw materials, many times in your reading uh, from chapter one up until now. What's that word mean, raw materials? Any ideas? Um, what's your paper made out of? What, what do we make paper out of? Y'all know? Trees. So trees and the land, you know, trees grow on land, right? So trees grow on land, and we need trees for paper. And so our books, our copiers, our notebook paper, all of this stuff used to be a tree someplace on land someplace. And some company, I don't know what, um, bought those trees, cut them up, made them into pulp, and put them into paper mill, and you are writing on it right now. So raw, if you are a textbook company, at some point in the production of the textbook you're using right now, at some point, raw materials called land and trees were used to make the money that those textbook companies make when you buy their extremely high-priced textbooks, right? Okay, so raw materials. I drove here in a car today that has rubber tires. Anybody know where rubber comes from? Tree. Rubber tree, again, trees, rubber trees. So, um, so yeah, raw materials, you know, I, I can see some cotton t-shirts and sweatshirts that you have on. Anybody know where cotton comes from? Yeah. Plants and fields, right? <laughs> Again, we're back to land, we're back to seeds, we're back to the plants themselves. In this case, cotton is a flower, and you harvest it, and it somehow ends up as a sweatshirt. Okay? So, so yes, these are the raw materials that we're talking about uh, when we use this phrase. The unedited version. Perfect. The unedited, uncensored version of stuff that we need in order to be able to, you know, to survive or to sell products or something, right? Yes. Um, so, those are things that are included in social resources, and actually, this raw materials one that we ended our explanation with, this raw material one, as a matter of fact, the more access or control over raw materials that you have, your category of people has. The more access and control over this, the greater this, the greater the money you're able to make, the greater the job position and the income you're able to have, the greater the education you have access to, uh, and the greater rights and privileges that you have, the more voice in government that you have, Okay, so all of these things are social resources that can be used to improve your position on this seven rung ladder that we have. Make sense? Okay. Bless you. Anybody have a question on anything else that you're thinking? Gee, I wonder if such and such is a raw material. So yes, ma'am. Oh, good question. We're actually going to talk about the difference between basic necessities and the differences between luxuries. Because, there, see how it says opportunities for these things? 
depending, since these rungs of this ladder represent different socioeconomic statuses, and socioeconomic statuses are um, a combination of these different, of different levels of these things. Because of that, your opportunity for basic necessities up here is extremely different than your opportunity for basic necessities down here. Does that make sense? And subsequently, or consequently, whichever word goes best there, consequently, not only are your opportunities for basic necessities very different up here than they are down here, but your opportunity for luxuries and comfort and leisure time, et cetera, are extremely different up here than they are down here. So yeah, so good question. So yeah, raw materials are, um, yes, raw materials can include the cow that is grazing someplace in Wyoming right now that is going to be your Big Mac next month. If it actually happened that fast, which it doesn't. But, um, <laughs> but yes, so the cow is the raw material for your hamburger. Do what? <laughs> I, I hope so, yeah. I've had some really freaky um, stories from culinary students about um, some of the stuff that they study in their, in their food production classes and in their sustainable energy classes or whatever the classes are called. Um, but they told me about this, um, this thing. I, I don't want to get too far off on a tangent here, but I, I've been telling as many people as I can, as I can tell. Um, there's this thing called cultured meat. Have y'all heard of this before? Hopefully it's not people. No, it's not. No, it's not cannibalism. But thank you for jumping to that. <laughs> but anyway, right before Halloween, cultured meat is like okay. I'm probably not going to explain it the best in the world. But I have a video actually on the YouTube channel in my playlist. There's a couple of different videos about cultured meat that I added to my playlist after my students were telling me about this. There is this new technology, and there's a huge um, factory for it in Memphis, actually. There's this new technology where you can take like teeny tiny little cells of meat, like you give blood at the blood mobile when it comes, you know, for the Red Cross. They can take a little tiny bit of tissue from like a chicken breast or from a cow thigh or whatever, and they can take that meat into a laboratory and make the cells grow into more meat. Yeah, that's a lot of fun. And it's called... Yeah, and it's called cultured meat. I know. I love your face. I love your face that you're making, Sarah. But yeah, um, look at the look at the playlist on my YouTube channel, and you'll see a couple of video, short little videos about the cultured meat thing. It's um, a little scary, but yeah, some some fast food. Yeah, lots of good facial expressions going on here. But um, some of the fast food restaurants, you know, to for, to talk about your comment that you said, you know, if it's really beef. Well, I think it's really beef. I guess technically it's really beef. Man-made. It, it, but it's like man-generated, yeah, yeah, or human-generated or whatever. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, it's weird. Weird stuff. So, um, so anyway, but, so, it puts a new, like, what else is a raw material? I guess, petri dishes? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Lab space? I, I don't know. So, anyway, all of these things that people use to make money, that people use to have influence in political situations that people use to have influence in rights being exercised or denied, that kind of thing, those are considered social resources and they factor into your socioeconomic status because the higher you are up on this, soci this ladder that we're using to represent the categories of people in, in the USA, the higher you are up on this, the greater access and control of social resources you have, and the lower you are on this, the, the less access and control over social resources that you have. Okay? So, we will get a name. There, there are names for each of these seven rungs of the ladder, but instead of getting names for them right now, I think what I want to do is give you... Um, can you take, you're going to take a picture of your notes yeah. at the very end? Either way. I think take a picture of your notes at okay. the very end. That might be good. Um, so I'll go ahead and just erase this and we won't have to wait for a picture of the board. But I'll, I'll erase this part of it. We have a term, a, an extremely important sociology concept um, having to do with 
social stratification. It's an extremely um, important word for you to understand the complicated meaning of because when you analyze these different rungs of the ladder in any country, when you analyze these different rungs of the ladder, um, understanding this concept that we're about to discuss is going to help you uh, describe the different styles of life, the different opportunities that people have or don't have access to, and here is the word that I'm talking about. Um, life chances. Two words. It looks like I made it one word. But anyway, life chances. Two words. It's a compound word that we are making a vocabulary word out of in sociology. Life chances. There is a definition of this word life chances that your textbook author uh, provides to you in chapter 7 and 8. It's a, it's a significant concept in chapter 7 and 8. Um, however, what I want to do with you now, so please pay attention to this because if you have to analyze, if I give you something to analyze and to try to describe social stratification, uh, you know, based on a certain scenario, like we did this video, this documentary film this time around, you're going to need to be able to take this word apart and like get it a little bit more detailed than what your textbook author does. Okay? So, in short, life chances are opportunities. Let me get a different pen. My, it looks like my pen is going, going dim on me. Life chances are opportunities people have in life for two different types of things. And I'm not going to put a period at the end. I had a period there. Let me put a colon there. Please notice that the definition does not end here. It's opportunities people have in life for two different times, types of things. I'm about to tell you what those two different types of things are. And if I ask you for a definition of life chances ever, you're going to have to give me what those two different types of things are in order for it to be a complete definition. and for you to earn the most points. <laughs> I haven't finished grading all the midterm things yet, but I noticed I, one of the questions, I don't remember what number, one of the questions asked you for the definition of social facts, for instance. And many of you got that definition correct. They weren't word for word identical. They don't have to be, just as long as you explain correctly what that word means. But many people got the first half of it and then put a period at the end of the sentence didn't continue. I saw many people put social facts or patterned ways of thinking, feeling, and acting, period. That's the first part of it. That's correct for the first part of it. But the following bit is those patterned ways of thinking, feeling, and acting control our behavior to a certain extent on the micro scale. They exist outside of us on the macro scale. They control our behavior on the micro scale. That's the second part of the definition that you would need to get full credit on something like that, okay? This one has a second part of the definition too. So please, I, I'm, I'm spending some time repeating myself, this has a second part of a definition because I've noticed in past semesters, sometimes people make the same mistake with this word that they do with the social facts word that I just saw, and they leave off this next bit. The next bit is what's the most important, okay? So, life chances, they are opportunities people have in life for two different types of things. The first thing is what you were talking about earlier, Coco, basic necessities. The first thing is basic necessities for life.
Now, there is a very good college level vocabulary word. It is not a sociology specific word, but it's just a very good college level vocabulary word that means basic necessities in life. I'm going to give that word to you now. I would prefer if you use that word, okay? But so the vocabulary word is called subsistence. Subsistence. This is not a sociology word. It is just a standard English word that college level people should have in their vocabulary. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Absolutely, yes. Subsistence it is how do you provide your basic needs. Okay. Hunting and gathering is one of them. That's one of, When I teach anthropology, that's one of my favorite units to teach, is the economics all wrapped up in subsistence strategies. So subsistence strategies, like you learn about in your anthropology class, are about how do you provide for yourself and your basic group, how do you provide the basic necessities in life? And so... There are different strategies, like a plan for survival, is what a subsistence strategy means, a plan for survival. There are different strategies to do. So for instance, hunting and gathering is one of them. Horticulture is another. Pastoralism is another. These are the ones that you're going to learn in um, anthropology class, right? Fun, fun class to take and a fun topic to, to discuss, in, in my opinion. But subsistence means how do you get the basic necessities in life? So before we move to the next one, I need to ask you, what are basic necessities to survive? Food. Let me give you shelter. Uh, I, heard, I heard food, water first. I was pausing with the water thing because in the United States, in my opinion, we are extremely spoiled about our water. Um, also, U.S. only. No, 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 no. This is not. No, I did. I let me clarify. It's a good question. I'm not asking you what in the U.S. do we need to survive. I'm asking just human condition. Human condition wise, what do people all over need to survive? And so I agree with your answers that I heard you say. I don't know whose voice that was that I heard when my back was turned, but I heard people say food, water, and shelter. Okay, so food, shelter, and let me give you another very good college-level vocabulary word. The word is potable water. Oh, not benton water. <laughs> potable water, agua potable. This is what we need. You can't just go and get some water out of the Arkansas River and drink it. I mean, you can. I want to watch. <laughs> but you'll probably get sick, right? It's not treated water that is safe for human consumption. So you have to have a strategy. You have to have a way, a plan, to get water that's safe for you to drink. Okay? And in the United States, we are really spoiled because you just made a joke about bit and water. But even though you might be grossed out about Benton Water, and actually at the South Campus where my office is, I regularly take my smart water bottle that I bought one time and for, for like $3 or something, however much those big bottles are, and I regularly go to the plain old sink in the faculty break area and fill up that smart water bottle with plain old, at, at the South Campus, we're in close to Bryant, and fill up the water bottle with plain old tap water and it grosses out one of my colleagues in particular who has his office. Tap water is perfect. In the United States, we are really spoiled. That's my opinion, okay? I'm stating my opinion here. You don't have to have the same opinion. But in my opinion, we are extremely spoiled about what we consider to be potable water um, or, or non-potable water. The water that comes out of your hose at your house, if you're on city water, the water that you wash your car with in your driveway, if you do that, that is potable water. We might be grossed out that it's coming out of our hose. I can tell that you're grossed out, <laughs> but this is potable water. But in the water. I think we just grossed out because, I mean, like, we're spoiled because we have the choice. Like, we, have we have it, exactly, exactly. We have life chances for water. 
So let, okay. So these are the basic necessities in life. Does anybody want to put unlimited data plan on here? Coffee. <laughs> we can't put coffee. We can't put unlimited data plan. The basic necessities for human beings to live are right here. Right here. You can include in the um, you can include in the definition of shelter clothing. Not every place in the world requires clothing to survive from day to day. Not every place does. But um, you know, it's about to get cool here, and we're going to have to have a jacket or something to not get sick and die, <laughs> you know, from exposure or something. So sometimes clothing is considered as part of shelter, right? You can consider you're sheltering your immediate body, or you're sheltering a group of people and their bodies. Yes, ma'am. That's a good question. Should medicine go there? No. Let's. Okay, so I have some no's right away, um, but. That's a good question, and again, it's going to depend on the, the other kinds of opportunities you have in life. When we look at um, chapter 8, and we look at the way the, the style of life is in other countries, you might change your opinion. Like, if you say, yes, medicine should be here, then some people change their opinion when they see life in other countries. Because again, you can take it back to that opinion that I just shared with you. We're kind of spoiled in the United States. We have so much of this that most of us need to lose weight. We have so much of this that we are picky and we are not gonna drink out of the tap water. We're gonna go pay a dollar for a bottle of water instead. Um, and the shelter, you know, we're also kind of picky on that because a van down by the river will probably will work. It'll work. But is that normal or is that deviant, right? So we've had that discussion too. So yes, there's a wide variety of food. Many cultures eat insects, for instance. Do we? No. We have so many other options that thinking of a grasshopper taco grosses y'all out, right? So yeah, so food, shelter, agua potable. That's what we need to, to survive as human beings. Maybe we should put another comma, and put medicine. But let's have that be a debate. Okay? So, number two. Number two is opportunities that we have in life for advancement and comfort. Advancement and comfort. Such as what? How about that one? I know I, I know I love my electricity. I know I love it. It makes life easier. You can stay up later at night and get work done that you weren't able to do because you have lights and you can see. Yeah, any kind of utilities. You know, I separated out electricity, but yes, we can just put the word of utilities in general because we need potable water, but, but guess what we have? It's pumped right into our house for us. That makes life easier. We have to focus less of our time during the day on getting food and potable water because it's just, you know, Walmart drops off mac and cheese boxes at my house. There's my opportunity, life chances for food. Walmart sends all kinds of canned goods that I order online. They send it right there, waiting for me when I get home. There's all kinds of potable water options. I've got a, what's that one of those things called? Soda stream. Y'all have one of those? I got one of those for Christmas. It makes like bubbling water. I don't even have just, just plain old still water. I got bubbling water. Doesn't like. <laughs> fizzy water. Not fizzy water that we want. Yeah. Okay, so opportunities for advancement. Electricity, any kind of utility, like you said, gas or you know, indoor plumbing, um, any kind of that. What about uh, phones? Phones? What about data? What about internet? What about Wi-Fi? What about transportation? 
Um, you know, even if it's just a bus pass or something. What about opportunities for jobs? What about jobs? What about all your educational opportunities? I know y'all could have chosen someplace different than this, than this college to go to. Just in this area. There's like six or eight different things within a 30 mile radius of this area that you could have chosen instead of this. That's a life chance. Just having those opportunities. Just having extra opportunities to get number one easily. So you don't have to focus so much of your daily energy on getting number one. And you can focus more of your daily energy on this. And healthcare is listed in this textbook in chapter seven when, they're, when the author is discussing life chances. Healthcare is there. Healthcare is there. Some people put it here as a basic necessity. Some people put it here as an opportunity for comfort. Yeah. Isn't there things in medicine and traditional nurses like they have their different like organizations and backgrounds? Yeah, um, being able, yes, like in the different subsistence strategies, especially like what Raina was asking about, the, the subsistence strategies that she's studying about in anthropology class. Yeah, there's a very, there's a vastly different knowledge about how do we use the resources that are available in our natural environment from the different types of subsistence strategies, like foraging or pastoralism or horticulture, agriculture, industrialism, like what we live in. Um, there's a very different idea about how you can do that kind of thing. Um, so, so yeah, the question is, where does that go? So help me, like, which, which one? Healthcare. And is it really healthcare, or is it like, Disease cure. <laughs> like, yeah, you know what I mean? Like, here's, a, here's another philosophical debate we can have about what the word healthcare even means. Because I don't know about you, maybe I'm not doing it right, but when I'm healthy and I feel healthy, like, I don't go to the doctor. No. <laughs> you know what I mean? So is it health care or is it disease cure? Just having the option. Just having the option, maybe so. However, if you have a pill, you use the example of a pill. So sure, we have like a pill-focused culture. Um, and so here's a pill, you can take this. But if the water you're drinking to take that pill is making you sicker in the first place, what good is If the water system in your entire country is infected with Ebola, so you can't even have a nurse who's helping deliver your baby wash her hands in it without maybe infecting everything. So we are a little bit in this country, again, here's my opinion again. We're a little bit in this country sheltered from reality of survival um, in other places because stuff comes to us so easily. In this, in this culture. That's my little editorial. That's not sociology information I just gave you. You, know, you won't be tested on my opinion, but that's just my little comment about it, okay? So yes, healthcare is definitely a life chance. It's debatable whether you put it in number one or you put it in number two. And maybe we need a little bit more practice using this to analyze not only our culture, but um, other cultures, other societies elsewhere, maybe we need a little bit more practice before we can firmly make up our mind, where do we put this? And just like this question that we were talking about earlier, there was no one correct answer for number one, two, three, or four on this midterm activity that y'all turned in. There's also not going to be one correct answer for where, where healthcare goes. If you decide healthcare goes right here and you have supporting evidence to prove that your claim is a valid claim and we should give you consideration, then here's your correct answer. If somebody else on the other side of the room or whatever, like a debate, if we, if we had a debate about it, has really good supporting evidence for why they think that healthcare should be here and they have really good supporting evidence that argues their point, then their answer is correct also. Okay. Yeah, because I say we didn't need health care, but I guess our vaccination is our health care. And that's why we don't get another. Our our vaccinations are 
one of the reasons why even our water system remains so clean. Like all of these things are intertwined. However, if you look at like infant mortality rates at birth, the United States as healthy, with air quotes, yeah. as we are, we rank extremely poorly in comparison to other places as far as like li number of live births per the number of pregnancies that we have in the United States. Really? Oh, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, and I don't, I mean, it's an interesting thing. I've never been able to fo to study that and like understand why. I just know that that's the statistic, so but I don't really like, know the reasons we're, behind we're it. talking about stillbirth and women. It's much worse for women of color. It's much worse for, for women of color than any other group. That's absolutely correct. What did you ask? Are talking about like stillbirth and miscarriage or? I think the statistics I think the statistics that I'm referring to are about full term babies being born, not miscarriages. I don't think miscarriages were in the statistics that I was looking at, but again, that's not my focus and I didn't I haven't spent time on looking at maybe the reasons why. But um, but I bring it up only because you know, again, <laughs> what is health where does healthcare go? Right? And what does healthcare even mean? Does it mean birth and babies because you know obviously the human human beings have survived for millennia yeah. without maternity wards right so so anyway there's another question about what does healthcare even mean is it pills is it tree bark that the medicine woman grinds up and cures what's ailing you like what is it right so okay so life chances these are opportunities we have in life don't stop there it's two different things. You have to tell me this, you have to tell me that. You are going to have to use this definition in two parts to analyze two different short sections of a film that I'm going to give you, um, I don't know, in a couple weeks to watch. It's like 15 minutes of this one and like seven minutes of this one that you'll have to watch to compare two different styles of life. One of the videos that you'll watch represents a rung of the ladder that's really low down here in the United States. So you're going to see the style of life that some of the people who, who occupy these bottom rungs of the ladder in the United States, what is their daily life like? You're going to see a video that shows you. Um, also, we're going to go internationally, and the country I believe that's in the video is Liberia. It's a country in um, southern, southwestern Africa that is actually has a link to the United States because Liberia was um, the country that was kind of created to repatriate freed slaves yeah. to Africa after emancipation. So Liberia and the United States have a connection, a historical connection um, like that. So we're going to look at um, these two situations in comparison to each other. And you're going to look, make a comparison about how would you rank the population that you observed there with the population that you observed here and what's the difference in life chances. Okay? Make sense? You look like you have a question. No? Just pondering it? Okay. So, we don't have these. How much time do I have? What time is it? 18. I have 18 minutes? Or it's 10, 18? Okay. So, um, so let's stop with new material for now and instead use the material that we just got to try to link it back to these social resources and ranking of social resources, access to social resources. And uh, let's see, okay, so education is the first one on our list over here. So we'll use education as the social resource we examine. And let's use... Um, Let's use this rung of the ladder. We don't have a name for it yet. We will. And let's use this rung of the ladder, okay? So, let me level the playing field a little bit. We're talking about education, but let me be specific. Let's talk about kindergarten, okay? Kindergarten will be the level of education we're talking about. Let's talk about... Um, Public school, private schools aren't available, home schools not available. Let's level the playing field that way too. And let's make the kindergartner who was born here and the kindergartner who was born there go to the same school and have the same teacher for kindergarten. 
think I've covered, I think I've, any other way we can even things out you can think of? Okay, so kindergartners, same school, same teacher, there was no option for private school or public or homeschool. Okay, so then here's my basic question. We leveled it like that. Do both of these kids in that case have the same life chances for education? I have a yeah, I have a mmm. It's an mmm, yeah. yeah. What'd you say? I said it could be in between. It could be, okay, mm, in between? Okay, okay. So let's, um, let's talk about the structure of the way we organize kindergarten in the United States. Anybody have a kindergartner in here? Yes. You have a first grader. So you've been through the kindergarten thing? Okay. So, so think about this. <laughs> Think about this. How old are you when you're in kindergarten? Five. five. So you've had five. When does the socialization process begin? Birth. Birth. The socialization process, the informal, lifelong learning process, begins at birth. So we've had five full years before the kindergarten teacher sees you to have been influenced by our life experiences at home. Does this person and th do this, what's, does this person and this person well, what do the wrongs mean? have, the wrongs are, what do the wrongs mean? I mean like, I know it's still. Does they all have to leave if the one on top of the has better chances of them? Well, let me, let me review or clarify what the wrongs mean because yes, you do have to remember what the wrongs mean in order for any yeah, of these questions. Yeah, like the top is like. Yes, so each of these rungs represents a different socioeconomic, I erased that, but yes, socioeconomic status. What are the three achieved statuses that socioeconomic status combines to make? Education, education occupation, income, okay? So down here, the parents of this first, uh, first grader, no, kindergartner, the parents of this kindergartner ha are on this rung because as adults, they have an education level that gets them an occupation that only pays so much money. Okay. So their education, their occupation, and their income, all three combined, are very low, so they put them here. And this person was born to parents okay. whose education gives them a different level of occupation, which gives them a different level of income, and there we go. So the socioeconomic, uh, so that was an important thing to review in this, in this question, so thank you for asking that. So they're in the same class, same teacher, but it's five years before I, me, that kindergarten teacher, see you, that kindergarten student, and so, Raina, I heard you say it's not equal. So, how then? How? You're talking about you're, you're talking about food availability. Oh, you do you think Coco's onto something? Yeah. So these two kids maybe have ac different kinds of access, different kinds of opportunity for different quality of food. Is that what you're talking about? Maybe the school meal is the only meal they eat. Maybe this guy has to be there early because they have to eat the breakfast at school too. So I have less sleep and one food source, potentially. Maybe there's food at home. But is the type of food that these people are probably going to have in their refrigerator the same type of food that these people are probably going to have in their refrigerator? What other kinds of styles of life, differences... It could be behavior, but what's back, what's like the background of that behavior? Yes, Sam. I was, I was going to ask that. I was adding like, let's say they both don't understand something. Just the act of the going back to the parents. Okay. So, so yes, yeah, so these are kind of two different things. But, yeah, so Coco's saying, what if this person doesn't understand something and this person doesn't understand the same thing? 
maybe like which parent might not only be capable of answering that question, it's not about the capability of these parents to answer that question, but which one of them maybe has their parent pick them up from school and take them straight home, yeah. or take them to a library after school program, or give or buy them a leapfrog for Christmas, or buy them, uh, what is the, I can't remember the name of the tutoring company, a friend of mine by like pays for tutoring something I can't remember right so if this person needs tutoring throughout his public school education or this person needs tutoring who's most likely to have a life chance for let's put tutoring on the list from kindergarten so this goes back kind of to a strive status very good connection. So you said, is, does this link back to a scribe status? And we actually brought that up very briefly when we were talking about Chapter 4. A scribe status includes things like race, age, sex, and class. These different rungs of the ladder are the different classes of people that exist in a society. And it, it exactly goes back to that because this, this guy can't help what class of people he was born to. This guy can't help what class of people he was born to. I think at the beginning of it, each time, a lot of times I look at it, it's like, you see, oh, you work hard and everything. That's true, the American dream. I'm so glad you bring that up. The American dream is the idea that if you work hard enough, you're going to be able to be a success. That's but if we start out kindergarten on different playing fields, let me tell you the kinds of things that you're going to see in the video that I mentioned that you're going to watch about people in the United States who are down here. If you have parents who dropped out of school in the fifth grade themselves because their parents didn't think education was important because the only thing that you needed to do was be an agricultural worker and at, in the fifth grade, you're big enough to handle some agricultural work, so you drop out to earn a very low income to help the family. And then those people who dropped out in fifth grade become parents themselves. Let me just tell you that they didn't drop out in fifth grade because they were a straight-A student. And unfortunately, it's also true that somebody can get to the fifth grade and not know how to read yet. Unfortunately, that's also a fact. Um, so, this kid and this kid, who do you think is more likely to have a bedtime story read to them? Who do you think is more likely to have like all kinds of resources like Netflix and Amazon and cable TV, direct TV, whatever, um, on a regular basis? Who has this kind of stuff, this kid or this kid? The top kid. So, does the top kid see Dora the Explorer and Blue's Clues and all those other different kinds of things? Mm -hmm. on TV where this one doesn't because this one might not even have his electricity on all the time because that's not free either and maybe mom and dad both if there is a mom and dad both um, are working in the evening and the elderly lady next door kind of keeps an eye yeah, I think that's another thing with the your work hours are going, your work hours as an adult are going to affect your child's educational experience because the way we organize the education system in the United States is part of the day and then home. And we send homework home. And you have to be supervised with that homework, right? So these two kids, we can even the playing field like we did, but because of the way the education system is organized, and I'm not critiquing the education system, I have no better idea for organizing it. I have no idea for organizing it. I would maybe get rid of everything past the 10th grade, honestly, but if, if you asked me, but, um, but that's not a very popular idea. But if these two kids start kindergarten on the very same day, in the very same school, with the very same teacher, the teachers nowadays, and maybe you have a comment like uh, about this since you have a first grader, the teachers nowadays interview they're kindergartners before they start school. The interview is simple. They ask things like, what's your name? What, where does your mama or your dad work? What's your mama's, what's your phone number? Well, if you're down here, do you always necessarily have the same phone number? Or sometimes when you have to go get another one, it's not available, the same one isn't available anymore? Or if you have two or three work numbers because you have two or three jobs? 
And, or if you didn't know how to read, maybe you don't know how to say your ABCs yet. If you don't, you know, maybe, maybe this guy knows all of the capitals of all of the states of everywhere in Canada too. Because they watch Dora the Explorer or something. Right? But I don't. And so when the kindergarten teacher asks me, what's my name? And I only know a nickname that people have called me all my life. I'm Precious. But Precious is not on the roster. And when the teacher asks me, what's your mama's phone number? And I'm confused and I don't answer her right away. And when the teacher tells me, go sit at the blue table before, you know, and let me figure out, let me talk to somebody else. And I don't know my colors yet. Is she going to think I'm stupid when she doesn't know what, she can't say that. There's no checkbox. Now you do. And if I don't at five, then I'm labeled as deficient mm -hmm. compared to somebody else. And let me just tell you, it might sound like, you know, I'm writing a dystopian novel or something, but people in this United States of ours right now, this moment, don't know what the color blue is compared to green, compared to yellow, compared to red, and that might be a language barrier, or it might be that you had your five and basically the most time you've ever spent with somebody is an eight-year-old who didn't have anybody teach them the colors either, so how would you know it? by the time you get there. What's a triangle compared to a square? I don't know. I've never heard those words before because I don't have TV in my house. I don't have adults in my house to talk to me about it. And so if I'm here and I go to kindergarten on the first day and here and they go to kindergarten on the first day, they don't have a label of deficient or resource, or what are the words that the education system uses nowadays? Resource? Remedial or something? Resource? And it's not because my brain wasn't identical to this guy's brain on the day of our birth. It's not at all because our brains weren't identical. It's about the life experience leading up to our first day of kindergarten. What do you think? You never think about it. I know. I know, it's so complicated, yeah. Any other questions or comments or anything? I don't. So the sense of, you know, if you kind of get that ascribed status in those things, kind of the sense of becoming a cycle. Not that technically, not technically, I'm a repeater point, but like in a cat system type of thing. Oh, okay, good, yes. We're going to go over what a caste system is compared to a class system. We'll spend just a little tiny bit of time discussing it. But yeah, the word caste is one of the very first vocabulary words that you will read in Chapter 7 when you're reading it. A caste system is, is a ranking based on your ascribed status. So if you were born here, the only place you can ever stay is right here because that's where you were born. In the United States, this ranking system and this American dream idea is the idea that this guy is going to be able to be this guy by the time their life is over. But it's way more complicated because now we have even, we've tried to level the playing field, but we didn't take these kids and put them in a boarding house, you know, since birth. So they haven't had an identical socialization process up till this point. And so does that put this kid behind from the very beginning? And there's the obstacle to maybe achieving this American dream, fame, fortune, whatever we describe that as, for everybody, the life chances to achieve what we would describe as the American dream is extremely different based on what rung of this ladder you're on. Yeah, definitely. And it's very complicated based on education and all this other stuff. Okay, other questions? I don't know how much of that 20 minutes we used, but we can stop here because I think we're pretty darn close. We're we close? We have five minutes left? Okay. So um, we're pretty darn close. So next week we will continue this discussion. And um, I think we actually have a week off from any assignments. This week? I think, I think for the next, yeah, I think like we have a week off from assignments. So like hallelujah, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So y'all have a great weekend. Yes, one fewer class to worry about. Absolutely. I read a post about